Hello, this is Ms. Canzon. Welcome to Foundations of Math. We're looking at 1.1, making con conjectures, inductive reasoning. You want to follow along on uh, page 6 in your textbook. So first of all, we're going to look at this question, this explore question. It says, if the first three colors in a sequence are red, orange, and yellow, what colors might be found in the rest of the sequence and explain? And I'll show you some sample answers here. So if the color sequence is red, orange, and yellow, the rest of the sequence could be green, then blue, then purple. So just following along on a color wheel using the primary and secondary colors. So another person might say, well, I think it's the colors of the rainbow. It's Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And yet someone else might say that we have uh, red, orange, yellow, red, orange, yellow, and the pattern might go in that way. So here we have people looking at a sequence and hypothesizing or thinking of some sort of pattern. Okay. So uh, next we're going to look at what we call this idea of looking at something and um, and patterns and stuff. This is called a conjecture, a testable expression that is based on available evidence but is not yet proved. So what we did is we looked at, when going back to this, we had a testable expression that was based on the available evidence but not yet proved. So some people said, said, oh, this is what I think the pattern is. That was a testable expression but it wasn't proved because we don't have the right answer for that one. So knowing what a conjecture is is very important. So now we have Georgia here, and Georgia is a fabric artist. She is patterning with equilateral triangles. Equilateral meaning that all three sides of a triangle are the same side. So looking here, that these three are all the same. Sometimes we put little marks to show that they're equilateral. So she made a conjecture about the following pattern. We have figure one, then figure two, then figure three. Her conjecture was that she thought that in figure 10, in this pattern, would have 100 triangles. And all these triangles is congruent to the triangle in figure one. Congruent is the geo geometry word for equal. OK, so let's look. We have figure one. We have one triangle. Figure one, one triangle. Figure two, we have one, two, three, four congruent triangles. Okay, we don't know, say that, oh, but we also have this triangle here, because we're only looking at congruent triangles, okay? And then we have figure three, sorry, figure three, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have nine triangles there. So she looked at this pattern and made a conjecture that she thought figure 10 would have 100 triangles. So let's look at this in a table here. Figure 1 had 1, figure 2 had 4, figure 3 had 9, and now what we're going to do is we're going to extend figure 3 and, and look at what figure 4 would be. So can you see how we're taking figure 1 is here and we're just adding another row? Here we're taking this big triangle here and just adding another row. So figure four, if you imagine that you extended it, and this is just rough drawing here, I would have a triangle here, there, something like that. So in this triangle, in this now figure four, I would have the nine, that I had before, and I added another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I would have 16. And if you extended this pattern once more, if you added a whole nother row onto here, you can imagine that you would add a whole nother row. Oh, these drawings are so beautiful. And you would add another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, another nine, and have 25. Okay? So something that you could notice, some numeric pattern that you might notice, is that there is a relationship between the figure number and the number of triangles. And in fact, you might notice that 
1 squared is equal to 1. 2 squared is equal to 4. And 3 squared is equal to 9. 4 squared is equal to 16, and 5 squared is equal to 25. So Georgia, back up here, when Georgia said that she said that figure 10 would have 100 triangles, what she did is she followed a pattern and then she made a conjecture. Remember what a conjecture is back up here? A testable expression based on available evidence but is not yet proved, she made a conjecture that figure 10 would then have 100. Okay? The question I, we're going to ask now is, George's conjecture reasonable and explain? So George's conjecture is reasonable because when the table is extended, to the tenth figure, the pattern of values is the same as George's prediction. How did she use inductive reasoning to develop her conjecture? And inductive reasoning is a, a very important definition you're going to want to know. It's drawing a general conclusion by observing patterns and identifying properties in specific examples. So that's what we did back here, is we had a pattern we observed and we found a pattern. We identified that the pattern, it was the figure number squared is equal to the number of triangles. Oh. Um, so how did she use inductive reasoning? Georgia used inductive reasoning by gathering evidence about more cases. This evidence established a pattern. Based on this pattern, Georgia made a prediction about what the values would be for a figure not shown in the evidence. And we're not going to worry about another conjecture. Okay, on to the next, um, the next example. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a conjecture about the product of two odd integers. So this is what Jay did. He took positive 3 and positive 7, multiplied them and got positive 21. He said that odd integers can be negative or positive. He tried two positive integers first and the product was a positive and it was odd. Next, he tried two negative odd integers, negative 5 and negative 3, and he got a positive and an odd. Finally, so he's done two positives, he's done two negative, he thought he'd try a positive and a negative. He did positive three times negative three and got negative nine. Uh, his product was negative and it was odd. So up to this point, his conjecture might have been every time that I have a product of two odd integers, I get a positive odd integer. But this example, this, um, this time, this trial that he did, he got a negative odd. So he his first conjecture didn't hold anymore, so he made a different conjecture. And he said that the product of two odd integers is an odd integer. Finally, he decided he would try one last one just to double check, and he chose some random odd numbers, negative 211 and negative 17. He multiplied those together, and indeed, he got an odd integer. Okay, so were you convinced by his conjecture? Do you believe that the product of every odd integer is odd? Of two odd integers is odd. And so some of you might say, yes, Jay's conjecture is convincing because all the different combinations with positive and negative odd integers were used as samples. These three samples show the pattern in their products, which Jay then tested with different integers. Jay's conjecture was supported by this last sample. And some of you might say, you know, I don't believe this guy. Jay looked only at three cases before he made his conjecture, then tested it with only one more example. This is not a lot of evidence to base a conjecture on. And the key here is that there's no right or wrong answer whether or not you believe a conjecture. Um, what you want to do when you are giving conjectures is give as much evidence and try every case that you can to try and convince people. They may or may not be convinced. Okay, 
we're going to um, use inductive reasoning to develop a conjecture about perfect squares. So we want to know the difference between consecutive perfect squares. We have quite a bit of math language here. First, we have consecutive. Consecutive numbers, one and two are consecutive numbers. They're numbers that come after one another. They're counting numbers. That's what consecutive means. Um, next, we have the term perfect square which I'm going to explain in a second. The other thing is difference. Difference means that we're subtracting. Okay, so our very first uh, perfect square we're going to look at is one squared. And it's called a perfect square because if I were to draw it, it's one times one, which, there you go, makes a perfect square. Okay, um, but we're doing the difference between consecutive perfect squares. So I said consecutive numbers were 2 and 1. So let's say we're going to do the difference between two perfect squares, consecutive perfect squares. So we're going to take 2 squared. I'm drawing it out right here. And we're going to subtract 1 squared. So we're going to take away. We're not going to count this. So what's left is 3. So 2 squared minus 1 squared is 3. Okay, next we're going to do the next pair of consecutive perfect squares. We're going to go 3 squared, so 3 by 3, and we're going to subtract, we're going to take away 2 squared. We're going to get rid of that. So we, uh, so that was 3 squared minus 2 squared. Graphically, what we're left with is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're left with 5. Okay. Let's go a little bigger. Let's go, hmm, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's do seven squared. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do I have seven there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, missed one. I still think I'm missing one. I think I got it there. We're going to do 7 squared, and we are going to subtract 6 squared. Oh, we're going to take that away. So we're doing 7 squared minus 6 squared. Sorry, my smart board's not cooperating, and we're left with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so here I've done a couple examples, and there's a couple conjectures that you might want to make. You could say that maybe you notice that the numbers 3, 5, and 13 are all odd. So maybe your conjecture is going to be that all the difference between consecutive perfect squares are always odd. Some of you might also notice that the numbers 3, 5, and 13 are always prime numbers. A prime number means it has no other factors but itself in one. Okay, so a couple of you might notice uh, these patterns, and using patterns to make a conjecture is called inductive reasoning. So that might be something that you, uh, a conjecture that you might make. Oh, sorry. We want to be here. Okay, now we did that question graphically, but you could also um, look at this same example and do and come up with a conjecture algebraically. So this is what Francesca did, is she started with uh, the smallest perfect square um, and the next greatest perfect square, 1 and 2. The difference was 3, so she said 2 squared minus 1 squared is 3. Then she did 4 squared minus 3 squared is 7, and 9 squared minus 8 squared is 17. So her conjecture as well was that the difference between consecutive perfect squares is always a prime number. And this example supports her conjecture. So she made the same conjecture that we did, that it was prime, but we also said that it was odd. Um, how is it possible that we had two different conjectures? We both did the same problem, but we came up with two different conjectures, two different hypotheses. One of us said that it was odd, the other one said it was odd and prime, uh, or just prime rather. 
um, it's possible to have two different conjectures about the same situation because different samples were used to develop the conjecture. We used different numbers. Francesca used different values for the sizes of consecutive squares. When she examined her evidence, the common features from her example was different from the common features that Stefan found from the evidence he had developed. We did Stefan's example together. So, it really depends what examples you are, which could lead to different conjectures. So the more examples and the more varied examples you, you do, the better. Um, there's an example in your book that looks at um, quadrilaterals and examining um, the midpoints of quadrilaterals. Uh, I want you to spend some time just looking over this. There's a couple of questions in your book that deal with some geometry vocabulary. So looking over these next two examples is important to do. They're, they're pretty easy read. Um, finally, I just want to summarize what we have learned. So inductive reasoning involves looking at specific examples. By observing a pattern and identifying properties, you're able to make a general conclusion, which you can state as an example. So inductive reasoning always starts with examples. From those examples, we find patterns. And examining those patterns, we try and make a general conclusion. Um, another thing you need to note is that a conjecture is based on evidence that you have gathered. And more support for a conjecture strengthens it. So the more examples, the more samples, you give is going to strengthen it, but it does not prove it. We're going to learn how to prove later on. Right now, we're just getting used to the new vocabulary that we've learned, inductive reasoning and conjecture. So to practice, it's a good idea to have a geometry set or at least a protractor. I want you to try pages 12 to 14, number 5, 6, 11, 19, 20, and 21. 21 is a discussion question that you're supposed to do with a partner. Being that we're online, I've set up a forum that I want you to go on to give your reasons. It asks for an opinion for you to decide if something is or is not a conjecture, and it asks you to justify or to back up your, um, your answer. So I'd like you all to complete these practice questions and let me know that you've done 21 by posting on the forum.